Keeping everything in sync between your server and each client is a challenging problem, especially with rigid bodies. And this is the main focus of this video. I know this is an advanced topic. One of my goals is that all of my subscribers reach the point where they can take on large code bases like megacities and not feel overwhelmed. If you fall into that category, don't worry, a little bit at a time and you'll get there. Let's start by learning a few new things today. First, we'll spend five minutes configuring netcode because this is our first day having multiple real players in our cart game. Hit that like button and let's get into it. Now before we can add multiple players to our game here, we first need to import a few more dependencies, one being TextMesh Pro, and I imported all the extras too because I like some of the extra fonts there are. And we also need netcode for game objects, of course, and you can see here I'm using version 1.4. So once those are added into your project, the next thing to do is we need to add a network manager. I'm just gonna go back over to the scene here and create a new empty game object. I'll just call it network manager. And that requires a network manager component. So I add that. We don't need to fiddle around with the settings too much here, but you do have to pick a transport. So let's just go with Unity Transport and make sure that the address is set to your local host. And then we can drag our player prefab in here, which we've called player cart. Now player cart doesn't have a network object on it or anything yet, but we'll get to that. Next, let's disable our cart spawner because we only wanna work with real players during this episode and next episode, and then we'll bring it all together after that. For this next part, I'm going to bring in a package that I've already put into the repository. It's just a few little scripts and helpers and one prefab that you can use in any netcode project. And they're very simple, I'll go over each of them really quickly. Uh, you can code them from scratch if you want, or you can go up to the repository and grab this package and import it into your project. I'm just going to drag it in quickly here. So as you can see, it just has a UI prefab and a UI script to go along with that that'll start up a host or a client. And it also has a client network transform, so we don't have to write that for every single project. Let's have a quick look at this network start UI prefab that I've built. If you look in the game view, you can see it's just two buttons, but let's take a quicker look at the prefab itself. Very simple, just a few text mesh pro buttons in a background. If we jump into the code for this, you can see there's just references to the buttons. The buttons have listeners. When they're clicked, they'll call the network manager singleton and either start the game as a host or a client and then hide the UI. Now let's jump over to the other script that was imported with the package, and that's the client network transform. This is an override of a normal network transform, which syncs transforms over a netcode network. But what we've got here is we're going to return on his server authoritative, we're going to return false in most cases, because we want the client to be controlling all the movement without a round trip to the server, so it's nice and snappy. And then we're also going to implement reconciliation so that the server is 100% authoritative. So now we'll have to add a few more components to our player prefab in order to get it working for multiplayer so that all the players have their own camera and their own networked objects. So over here on the player prefab, first of all, I'm going to disable the skid mark handler for now. Then I'm going to add a network object component. You can leave all the default settings. Then we'll add the client network transform that we just pulled in. We don't really need to sync the scale, but I'll leave all the other ones for now. And then I'm also gonna add a network rigid body, which is helpful just for syncing things between the client and the server and actually seems to work pretty well. After this, we need to deal with cameras. So we don't need a virtual camera in the scene just for one player, we need a virtual camera for every player. So let's just delete that from the scene. And then let's also remove the Cinemachine brain from our main camera and turn off the audio listener. We only want the audio listener on for each player's individual camera. Now let's jump into the prefab and make those changes. So we can add a new camera here onto the player prefab. We'll disable the audio listener on all player prefabs by default, and we'll add a Cinemachine brain to this one. And then we'll add a virtual camera with exactly the same settings that we had before, which was five and minus 30. Now we just need it to target the actual player. So let's drag in the references there. And then we're gonna need to configure these, like turn the audio listener on and off and we also want to jack up the priority on this camera so that for this particular player, this the virtual camera attached to their cart is the one that's rendering for them. So we need references to both those things. Let's jump over to code. 
So in our cart controller script, let's add two new serialized fields, one for the Cinemachine virtual camera and another one for the audio listener. And that way, when this cart spawns into the game, we can make some changes to those things. So let's change our start method to be a public override void on network spawn. And in here, we can handle things of that nature. Now we have to make one very important change to our cart controller before we can start using this. And that is we need to inherit from a network behavior, which is in turn inherits from mono behavior. So back down here in on network spawn, first of all, let's make sure that we're the owner. If we're not the owner, then we want to turn off that audio listener and we want to set the camera priority to zero. But if we are the owner, let's set it to a higher priority like 100 and let's turn on the audio listener. Now, all these components um, having to do with the rigid bodies and the axles and get it finding components, let's move that out of here. Let's put it right into the awake method. That way we're 100% sure that the rigid body component is going to be found and we'll be able to start using it. Okay, back in Unity, we can assign references to those serialized fields. So I'll drag Cinemachine in there, drag the camera with the audio listener in there, and that's pretty much it. Let's have a quick look at build settings because it's time to try it out. If we jump into our project settings quickly, uh, under player, there's a section here called resolution and presentation. And under there, you can make some settings about how you want your output to be. So let's change it from full screen window just to a windowed build. And let's check uh, running background. And let's also tick off um, resizable window. That way you can kind of fool around with it while you've got Unity open and play with two players. Now I'm just going to save my scene and project. Okay, I'm just going to hit Control-B and run a build, but you can come up to the menu and do it that way too if you need to. I'll kick that off, and that should open our game so we can test this out. Okay, here's our build. I'm going to run this one as the host. Looks like we could adjust that spawning point, but we're going to work on the spawner in a future episode. Today is just about multiplayer, so I'm going to park this guy over here, and then I'll jump back over to Unity and run the editor version as the client and let's uh, have a look. So we've got two players in the world now. That looks all right. I'll just pull over here and bring up the other window so we can just see how it's performing. So yeah, definitely they're driving independent. The cameras are independent. Everything's great. Now we can turn to the topic of client prediction and reconciliation. So first let's talk about the why before we start digging into the how. Uh, not all the machines that connect to your game are created equal. Some players will have lag sending their inputs to the game, and some people will try and cheat by sending incorrect data. For these reasons, you want to have 100% server authority most of the time. But to keep the snappy movement you need for a racing game or an FPS, for example, you need the client to be able to predict their own movements as well. Now, somehow we have to synchronize the information coming from the client with the reality happening on the server. So if these things get out of sync, we have to apply a correction, and that's called reconciliation, where we rewind to the last correct point and replay the inputs again on the client. So to do this, we need a standardized measure of time between everyone in the game that is totally frame rate independent, since the speed at which the players experience the game will be different for everyone. To do that, we're going to implement a network timer class that simply counts off ticks. Then we'll take snapshots on the client at every tick for the input values, as well as the state of their cart, the position, rotation, velocity. On the server, we'll also capture the state every tick, and we'll keep a queue of the player's inputs as we receive them. The server will simulate the physics and send the correct state back to the client. That's when a reconciliation will happen, if necessary. Make sense? Let's start creating our data structures, which won't take long, and then we'll implement and test that it works by adding our own teleport cheat. In our implementation, we need to ensure that we have a synchronized way of ticking both the server and the client, and that's where this network timer class will come in. So min time between ticks represents the minimum time in seconds that should pass between each tick on the server, and the frequency of these ticks determines the server's tick rate. In the constructor, we're defining this as the reciprocal of the server tick rate. So if the server tick rate is 60 frames per second, the minimum time between ticks would be about 16.67 milliseconds or so. It keeps the server updates at a frequency equivalent to 60 frames per second. Now the should tick method will check this 
to see that at least the minimum time has passed since the last tick, and that'll ensure a consistent tick rate for the server. Here, the time is incremented by each frame's delta time, and then check if it's greater than or equal to the minimum time between ticks. If it is, the timer gets reduced by the minimum time between ticks, and a new tick is appended, and the function returns true. If this sounds really confusing, just think of it like each tick is a little timestamp we're going to put on every input and every state that we're going to pass back and forth between the client and the server to synchronize everything. So the next data structure we need is a generic type circular buffer. Now, a circular buffer is just going to be an array which loops back upon itself once it reaches the end. So by having an abstraction here, we don't have to worry about doing all these little modulus operators in our code. Now, subscribers to this channel will know that I stray away from primitive obsession. And you'll find as you become more proficient at coding, whenever you see value stored in a primitive object and there's behavior associated with it, such as adding or getting items from it, you should think about putting that into some kind of structure, whether it's a class or a struct or otherwise. So we're going to use this to store all of our input data and all of our states because we don't need to store them forever. We just need you know, enough to synchronize things. Having a circular buffer is an extremely efficient way to do that. Okay, next we're gonna define two structs that implement the iNetwork serializable interface. The first one is gonna be for input, and we're gonna send in our tick and a vector two about our move vector for now. And we'll implement the missing members and Copilot will fill this in. We're just gonna serialize those values for transport. State payload, very similar. What's the state of our cart? Position, rotation, velocity, angular velocity. So again, we'll implement the missing members. There's our two data structures that we're gonna pass back and forth between the client and the server. So now all we have to do is just implement this in our cart controller. Let's have a quick look at the flow again of how this is gonna work. First of all, the client is gonna move the cart just like they do right now, but we're gonna send that input afterwards to the server. On the server side, we're gonna simulate the physics of the cart movement and then send that back to the client. When the client receives that data, we'll decide if we need to reconcile or not. So let's move a bit further down and we'll declare all of these variables. We've got our timer. We've got the FPS that we expect the timer to be running at on the server. We've got the size we wanna define for all of our different circular buffers. So for the client, we wanna keep track of what state we're at at every tick. We want to keep track of the input used at every tick. And we want to know which state we processed last that came in from the server. So we'll get the one that came in from the server and we'll also store which one we successfully reconciled to. We'll call that last process state. Then server specific stuff, the server needs to keep track of all of its simulated states. And it also needs a queue to process all the inputs as they come in. Now we can scroll down to our awake method and we can initialize each of those variables. So our timer, the client state buffer, the client input buffer, and the server side ones as well. Now in the update method, we're gonna update our timer, but in fixed update, we're no longer gonna run all of our move code. Instead, we're gonna extract that into a move method that just accepts the move vector. That way we can run all the code in the move method, whether we're on the server simulating it or we're on the client and actually running it. So then we'll come back up to the fixed update method. Let's say, if we're not the owner, just get out of here, bail out. Otherwise, as long as our timer is telling us that we should be producing ticks, we'll handle the client tick and handle the server tick for every tick that it pumps out until it's done. And that'll be the conclusion of our fixed update. So let's implement this more or less in the flow of the diagram. So first of all, every time we want to move, we should actually take the state of the movement and store it into a payload. So I'm gonna wrap the move method with a process movement method that just returns that payload. It'll run the move and then get all the information about our state and put it into a state payload and pass it back. And now we can implement our handle client tick. If we're not the client, return. Next. Let's get our current tick from the timer. Now, based on the tick, we can figure out where the buffer index is in our client input buffer to store this information. So assemble the payload, put it into the buffer, and then we wanna send that information to the server so that it knows what we've been doing. So to do that, we'll create a server RPC in a minute and we'll send it the input payload. 
Now we actually want to process this input on the client side, and then we'll take that state payload and save it on the client side so that we can handle reconciliation at the end. So I'm just going to add a commented out method here for that. We're going to do the reconciliation part very last. Let's quickly fill out the server RPC. Actually, Copilot already knows what to do. I'm just going to tab complete this. So on the server side, when the server receives the input payload, it's just going to enqueue it into its input queue. So speaking of which, let's handle the server tick. So on the server tick, what we want to do is as long as there's input in the queue that has been sent to us from the client, we're going to run that. So here we'll start a while loop that will just run until the queue is empty. On every iteration, let's dequeue an input payload. We'll figure out a buffer index based off of the tick that's in that payload. And then we can get a state payload by simulating the physics from what we expect to have happened from that input payload. So we'll write a method for that in a second. Once it's done, we can actually store that state in the server state buffer. So now, if our buffer index moved at all, we need to send whatever's been processed back to the client. So we'll do that with the client RPC. We'll grab out the state wherever the index is at, send it over there. So for our client RPC, let's make sure we actually are the owner of this. If we're not, bail out. And then we can set the last server state equal to whatever the state payload was that we just passed over there. Now, to simulate the physics, we're going to accept the input payload that we want to simulate for. So to simulate physics, first we're going to change the simulation mode to be script. Now we can run our move method based on the input payload. We can step the simulation ahead one fixed delta time. Then we'll change the simulation mode back. Now we can just return a state payload of whatever the current state is. All right, let's jump back into Unity and see how this affects our game. Now, keep in mind, the number of ticks coming out of our timer is much greater than any fixed delta time update or any regular delta time. So watch what happens here. The cart moves extremely fast. So it just zips down the track. Turning is out of control. Uh, it's just way, way too fast. So let's jump back into code. When we're handling our grounded movement, we're actually lerping a force onto our rigid body's velocity to speed things along. And we have that in a little section here called acceleration logic. So instead of just regulating this by time dot delta time, we want to regulate it by the minimum tick time, which we have stored in our timer. So instead, what we'll do is get a lerp fraction here and we'll just split it down. And that way, every time the tick goes off, we're just incrementing by that fractional amount and not the entire delta time. So let's go back to Unity, refresh the assets, and try it out at this speed. So this is much more reasonable, but the turning is still quite strong. And that's because we haven't regulated it at all and it's turned up to quite a high amount. So I'm just gonna stop here. Let's come over to our player cart prefab. Now we could handle this a little bit with code, but we can also just reduce the turning strength here. So I'll turn it down to about half of what it was, and that should do us for right now. Okay, so in just a couple minutes of work to do left here, and that's to implement our reconciliation. So I'm gonna uncomment this method and let's start writing it down here. We'll make a few little helpers for this too. The first one being, let's uh, create a, just a method to abstract whether or not we should reconcile or not, because we could just bail out of here if there's nothing to do. Now, uh, if there is, we need a couple variables, and primarily among them, we need to know which state are we actually going to rewind backwards in time to. So we'll get a buffer index so we can handle this. Um, if there's not enough information, that is the buffer index falls really close to zero, then there's not enough data to really reconcile with. So we can also bail out at that point. Now, a special condition is, what if we are the host of the game? In host, server RPCs execute immediately. So there's no latency between the client and the server. So what we can do there is just get the most recent state that was actually in the server state buffer. Otherwise, we'll use the last server state that was passed to the client. Now we can calculate the distance. If the distance you know, was within a certain range, 
which we haven't defined yet. And just jump up to the top here and let's make this a float and we'll just say it's say 10. So what we care about is whether or not the two states have a mismatch of a distance that's greater than that threshold. And if that's the case, we need to reconcile the state and all the states from that point up to where we are now. So we'll make that in another method. Let's come up to the top and we'll define our should reconcile method. There's really two reasons we would want to reconcile. So I'm going to put them into their own variables just for readability. The first one is, is this a brand new server state that we've like other than the default and uh, the default for a value object is just generally all of its values equal to zero. So it's never been initialized. Or the other condition would be, is this state different than the last process state? Or the last process state doesn't exist, never, never been processed. So if so, then we're going to actually reconcile the state. Let's come down here and we'll start declaring that method. So when we're reconciling a state, we want to say, we're going to reset our position to be exactly what it was at the state that we're going back to. So let's set all those values first. And now if the rewind state is the last state that we received from the server, then this is where we're going to stop. We've done our duty. We're going to get out of here. And typically that would mean that we are the host. So let's take that rewind state and put it into our client state buffer as if we had actually performed that state in the beginning. And now, we're just going to go through all the way, all the inputs from that tick to right now, our timer.current tick, and we are going to replay all the actions with our process movement method, and we'll be able to put a new state into our buffer, and we should be totally caught up with whatever the server said we should be. Now, it's possible that there are still deviations, and if there are, the next reconciliation would make up for that. As you develop this kind of system into much more complicated multiplayer scenarios, you're not going to be trying to call server RPCs every frame. It would be crazy. You want to send them in bigger packages and, you know, reduce network traffic and employ some compression and lots of other things. This is just the, probably the most bare bones example of this that uh, we need for this card game. Now, as I was talking there, I realized that uh, Copilot filled in something incorrect here. We're not trying to find the distance between our current position and the rewind state. We want to find our state that was in our client state buffer at the same index position as that rewind state. So fix that up. Okay, so this is all great, but how can we really see that it's working in the, in the Unity editor? Well, I think what I'm going to do is come up here and right where we initialized the threshold variable, I'm just going to add a header and a few more serialized fields. And what we can do is just add a few cubes into our scene that'll ride along with the cart, and one will represent where the client thinks the cart should be, and the other one can represent where the server thinks the cart should be. So we can update those positions when we're handling the server tick and when we're handling the client tick. Um, and then I'll just come back into Unity here, and in the player prefab, I'll just create two, two new game objects here. They, they don't need colliders, that'll mess up our cart, but uh, they can just be regular cubes, uh, maybe a little bigger than this. Let's make them maybe three. I'm moving them up in code, but just so we can see them now, I'll move them here. And I made a few materials. So red will be the server and green will be the client. Let's drag those references into the new fields that I made. Now, to make sure this goes off, I'm going to introduce a cheat. So in the update method, if the Q key is pressed, that will move the transform of the client forward by 20, which is past our threshold. And then down in the right before we're going to reconcile, if we've decided it's time to reconcile, let's break and pause the editor so we can see exactly where those cubes are and what happens when we step ahead. All right, so let's jump back into Unity refresh the assets, and then hit play. So I'll just move up ahead a little bit onto the track here and pause. And let's focus in on the cart and have a look. So you can see the client and the server at this point are just a little bit off from each other, but nothing to really worry about. If I go back and now I hit the Q key, it's going to pause the game for me and let's go have a look. Now you can see they're pretty much exactly 20 apart. If I step ahead, 
Now, the reconciliation, by the time this brake went off, already happened. And it, you might have been able to see it in the video. The cart got snapped ahead and back. Uh, and then just the way the code is set up right now, the cubes don't get updated until the next round. But uh, you can clearly see that there, the discrepancy and why it corrected itself. So I'm going to turn the debugging off and go back into here. Now I'm going to hit it as I'm driving. So you can see I'm, I'm fast forwarding myself into the future by, two, by 20. And uh, here, if I can get back on the road again, uh, I'll come back out here onto the track and then I'll start hitting it in forward and try a few in reverse. So you can kind of see it's, it's so fast, it's only one frame. So potentially if your racers were trying to cheat and they moved themselves up by 20 or 100 or whatever, teleported to somewhere else in your game they're not supposed to be, then you can correct them in this manner. So this is all working pretty good. Next week's video will be on the same topic, but more specific to clients that are not the host. We'll be discussing the topic of extrapolation, which is a form of lag compensation, and we'll be making a few other changes to the project. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if this kind of content appeals to you, and hit the like button if you haven't yet. I hope you have fun implementing this netcode stuff in your own project, and I'll see you in the comments below.